well, I'm ahead, should I really? Um, thank you very much, uh, and good evening, and welcome to this uh, rather unusual and special thinking. Um, I'm Matt Dancona, I'm an editor at Tortoise, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here to celebrate, uh, mark the return of Maverick and Top Gun to our screens, uh, and try and work out why the hell this 1986 high concept movie about men in planes. Uh, now in the sequel, Men and Women in Planes. I mean, progress is amazing. Um, <laughs> seems to have become the rocky horror of action movies. <laughs> Everyone who watches it, or a lot of people who watch it, myself included, have become obsessed by it, know the words, and now they've had the sequel, and like all fans, they've said, oh, I'm really good, and, and now they're all in love again. And so here we are. Um, and... We're very lucky to have um, in person uh, and uh, on deck one of the <laughs> one one of the great fighter pilots of our train, uh, Marina Hyde, who is I mean exactly I mean what well, no introduction necessary actually does apply here. However, just just as a point of clarification. Um, there was an error in these slides, which it called me Maverick, right? As all bloody political commentators know, and myself included, there is only one Maverick, right? And the rest of us are on a good day, goose. <laughs> Live or dead, depending on which bit of how we're doing. Or on a bad day, cougar. People who've seen the first film will, will, will understand the reference. Um, she's won more awards than Meryl Streep. And I, in fact, I understand that Meryl won't ha hear her name mentioned around the house. Uh, she really is a one of a kind. And, and, and it's typical of Marina, actually, that I, I discovered years ago that we shared this very odd sort of obsession. It's totally normal. Everyone here shares it. Yeah, I well, I, it, you're amongst friends. Yeah, this is, this is, a, safe, this is a, safe this a safe space, space right? <laughs> but it, it is, and we'll, we'll talk about this in, in, in due course, but it is a very, uh, a very peculiar phenomenon. Um, also online, we have Mark Simpson, um, who's author of a bunch of acclaimed books, including Male Impersonators and St. Morrissey, uh, and quite an accolade, actually, in the cultural world. He is, he is um, credited with coining the term metrosexual, which really has entered, you know, com common parlance. So it's quite, some quite something to, ha to have a phrase like that attached to your name. He has written often on Top Gun and has, and has strong views on the sequel, so we shall look forward to hearing from Mark and Josh uh, Ron, who's um, a very uh, distinguished um, <laughs> broadcaster and, 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 as you can see, uh, aviator wearer. Hi there, Josh. Um, <laughs> keep taking the... Um, and and uh, has, writ has appeared on all sorts of channels, um, notably, um, most recently, GB News, but BBC and um, Talk Sport and many others. Um, he's, he knows so much about the world of entertainment, it's ridiculous. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to hearing from all three of them. If you're dialing in online, welcome, and Mark St Andrew, call sign All Saints, will be um, uh, on hand to ensure that you don't dip below the flight deck. So that's all good. Uh, perfectly sane so far. Now. Um, Let's just dive in, you know, in a negative G2, G4, yeah, inverted, yeah, yeah. to hit the MiG. Um, wh 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 uh, why is, <laughs> is, an, uh, is an acclaimed writer like yourself, what we read all the time, um, so fixated by a 1986 movie starring Tom Cruise wandering around uh, locker rooms and saying things like, I am dangerous. Well, first, how does this come about? Well, first of all, no, but I loved it right from the original, you know, when we had to sneak into the cinema, because I think it was a 15. I can't, I don't, I'm not quite sure how, but it was a 15, was, yeah. and you had to sneak in, um, because I was, I think, only about 12 or 13 when it came out. And, in fact, no, I must have been, yeah, about 12, I was about 12 when it came out. I loved it instantly. It was amazing. I mean, it was an amazing sort of... It was so, I mean, it's so self-confident, and in some ways, movies are less self-confident. I mean, I'm not talking about Marvel things, but um, are less self-confident in... And I just, I just, it sort of exploded. But also, it stars, in my view, maybe the last movie star, apart from Julia Roberts, maybe, but the, he, he, and he explode. That was not his... Breakout role was obviously, like, Risky Business risky or whatever, business, but this yeah. was the blow-up role, where he just became the biggest thing 
in the whole, you know, everybody was obsessed with him and yeah. it, obviously category five nutter, but it doesn't matter, look what they, <laughs> no, look at well, what I wonderful mean, things he's given to us. <laughs> no, no, he has, I mean, I think on balance, you know, we're, we're very much in, in huge debt of gratitude to him globally, but, um, did, when you, I mean, think back to the, you know, the, the 12, 13 year old Marine Hyde yeah. sneaking into Top Gun, world changing experience, that's a film star. If I'd said 36 years from now, he'll look exactly the same <laughs> and you'll be watching pr a pretty similar movie and thinking, you know... That's He's drunk the milk of paradise. He has, hasn't Not he? Not like Kelly McGillis, who actually... Well, now we, absence, we'll, we get to the bone already. We um, get to the bone. She's an absence. Uh, she, she, um, she, she gave a hilarious quote on it, maybe last week or something, where she said, no, of course they haven't asked me. I'm, like, fat and 64 and, age, and I look age-appropriate. <laughs> <She> seemed... <laughs> Tell us what you really think about if, Tom Kelly. has yet to see Top Gun, I find it hard to believe that that's true of, of anyone. But um, if they haven't, Kelly McGillis plays uh, Pete Maverick Mitchell uh, as a love interest and instructor, call sign Charlie. Um, and there's a picture of a little picture of there, I think. And, oh, and there too. Um, and as Marina said, she, she wasn't invited back for part uh, two uh, for reasons that... Um, well, actually, I, I'll leave that till later because I think there's more to discuss about that. But, it, but it's interesting that all the guys have been asked back, really, that the, the matter. And obviously, Goose can't come back, but his son comes she back. She has other stuff to do. She, she has to, other stuff to she do. She raised a barn with Harrison Ford. She, yes. You know, she got Jodie, Jodie Foster revenge for all those horrid rednecks. You know, I mean, she yeah. had a lot of stuff to do, Cameron yeah. McGillis, in the 80s. Yeah. So. But it's got to hurt, hasn't it? Well... As no, the I whole think... world watches Top Gun Maverick, you I know. I imagine she doesn't give a shit. Yeah. <laughs> Do you really? Yeah. yeah. Even I later nights, three a.m. She sounds very cool. Okay. Yeah. No, I think she. Right. I think she's at peace with herself. Well, that's a relief. I, I mean, don't know some, if Mr. Tom one Cruise less thing is. to worry I don't about. I Mr. Tom Cruise is, but I. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think he still remembers her name? Oh yes, he would be incredibly respectful if that's asked true, about actually, her That's true. Actually, he'd have written her a handwritten yeah. note on Scientology notepaper. You know, he would be very respectful. Sorry that you're too old to appear in my movie. Love Tom. Um, so going, I mean, let's go back to, to, to Sir Thomas de Cruz. Um, it, it's very interesting how <laughs> he is the presiding spirit of this, from, really from the word go, that, that Don Simpson and Jerry Bruckheimer find a, an article in a, in a magazine, I think, called California, which is about the fighter, the yeah. fighter, fighter pilot school. And they think that would make a good movie. Oh. And they woo Cruz, who's coming out of risky business. He's not yet a global superstar, and say, we want you to do this. And he says, OK, but I think it's a sports movie. And they say, the what, the how, the who? And, and, and his logic is, let's not make this about the enemy, which is why they all have the, the black visors. And you yeah. don't really... Let's make this about the, the tensions and then the sort of, sort of sweaty camaraderie at the end. And all the let's make it about a team. And I don't, I don't know what you think, but that, although it's a typically insane thing to say, there's also a measure of truth in it, isn't there, about the first Top Gun? Oh, absolutely. He, uh, he understands all those things. He's an incredibly... He understands all those things. He does have an amazing sort of movie vision. Um, but, yes, it is, it's about a, a team. And, but maybe it... And it was... I suppose it comes at the sort of height of kind of... Reaganism and 80s Cold War, sort of like us versus them. Um, and I suppose, yes, I think he got that totally right. Obviously, it, it worked brilliantly. But I think they had a lot, quite a lot to do with the whole... Oh, no, they definitely, definitely. Um, and I think they were, they were very much on set. And, and although I think Tony Scott, who made the first film, foolishly thought that he was going to be making a kind of apocalypse now European art house film, <laughs> uh, which wasn't quite what the gig turned out to be. But never mind. Um, he's no longer with us, sadly. Um, wh what did you think of the, of the new film? You know, what were you, what were you... I loved it. Right. I completely loved it. It was incredible. Did you go, did you go in with scepticism, that kind of, you know, zealots, this is not going to be any good I thought good he wouldn't you. be involved in any rubbish, so yeah. given that he doesn't have to make those choices. So I thought he'd be more careful than... Um, I, I loved it. It's a sort of... Even though I know we've said he we, we've drunk, he drunk the Mental Paradise and all of that, I do think it's a sort of movie about getting old in a little, a little bit of the way that something like Skyfall was, where you see Bond getting old and having, you know... Um, it was sort of incredibly respectful of the first movie, to, almost to the point... I actually saw it on the first day of the Jubilee and thought, there's quite a lot of similarities with this. You know, he's, and it's no surprise to me that he was involved in the Queen's sort of 
for absolutely randomly birthday just celebration. Up, just turned up randomly and was involved in the Queen's birthday celebration yeah. about three weeks ago. So I thought, you know, but it was so sort of, you know, there's bits that are just shot for shot. Um, and I suppose, you know, you're giving the public what they want. Um, and even at the bit at the start where, I don't, I don't know if everyone's seen it, but this is right in the very first sort of, the stuff that's essentially, he's, it's almost, it's the supersonic flight, it's going, it's, it's basically... Almost in space, isn't it's it? It's almost a little bit of it, like he'll say, yeah, I'll give you a bit of your Star Wars at the start, right? Mm. Now you can see how a proper sequel's made. Yeah. <laughs> and then... That's and, true, and, actually, yeah. yeah. And then... And then, but the rest, a lot of the rest of it, I thought it was funny how you got to learn their mission so well because you went through it so many times. That was really something for a, a gaming generation where yes. you, you've, you know, you've, if I, in the end they're going to complete, be able to complete this level and complete the game. Well, it was almost yeah. explicitly a video yeah. game, the rest of it, yeah. wasn't it? It was a war mission. Um, just out of interest, of those who've seen the film, uh, Strawpole, who liked it, the second film? So, not bad. Some recalcitrance. It'll be very interesting to hear what the antis are because it, it, it's sort of more than any film I can remember in recent years. It's had a kind of. The other thing I felt about it was that the first, as you've already said, the first one is just so eminently quotable and you can yes. name, there's so many lines in it. I didn't, I couldn't remember a line of it when I came out of the yes. movie theatre. And I also felt, whilst it was a sort of weird emotional experience, um, I, because of, I love the first one and all of that, I didn't feel that, I thought, I'll probably watch Top Gun another ten times in my life, but I'll probably watch that once more. That's interesting. And when you, uh, do you, do you think the Top Gun universe is meant to be taken seriously, or is it fantastic? Oh, desperately, yeah. Yeah. He, no, you've got to take it all very seriously. He yes. does often like to subvert what people think about him as a movie star. Michael yes. Mann thought that particularly, but I think you have to take it super seriously. Yes. Because on the other, I mean, I think it, it's not stretching the definition of the word to suggest that some of the scenes are quite camp. Um, oh, hugely. To the point of being, you know, a row of tents. And I, I, do, are we meant to take that seriously? I mean, the, the, when we take Top Gun seriously, which bit are we taking seriously? This is the question. I take all of it That's desperately seriously. Answer, I actually, think it yeah. should all... But also, you have to... But, I mean, it was sort of... Every tiny bit... So that's Penny Benjamin, even things like that. Do you yes. remember there's that line about Penny Benjamin in the first thing when they're sending him to Top Gun and saying, um, you've got a history of five high-speed passes but pass control tiles and one an admiral's, admiral's daughter. daughter. And it's like, Penny... oh, right, they've, they've even brought her back. Again, brought... rude not to acknowledge McGillis. Rude. Rude. Very rude. Rude yeah, not to yeah, acknowledge yeah. Charlie. Yeah, very rude. Yeah. No. I mean, it does have its rudenesses, doesn't it, yeah. Top Gun? It's not a, it's not <laughs> a perfect... Who's the enemy? Well, I think this is this is an interesting question because I th again, f and for the second one, Cruz was very insistent that they not have um, an identifiable enemy. Now, of course, because of the war, everyone thinks it's meant to be Russia, stroke China. I thought we were out in some North Korean tundra or something. Uh, like well, that. exactly. You're yeah. meant to. I mean, I think it's because they're a not allowed in yeah, video a game enemy. Really, yeah. you know. It, um, but because we're meant to be concentrating on Miles Teller and his exciting shirts, um, and not on the enemy. I think that it works out well. It's a, essentially it's message is peace. I think, don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> peace yes. in our time. <laughs> peace for our inferior far part. Do you? I mean, do you have any? Is, is this a normal thing for you? Do you have a whole sort of cluster of nineteen um, eighties movies that you can quote at length, or is this the yeah. special one? There yeah, are, there's loads of them. Uh, yeah, could, there's a like lot to... of movies in general. I'm trying to think what they all are. I mean, you know, I went to a girls' boarding school, so I've seen. Dirty Dancing, probably 350 times. Right. Um, there's, See, but there's all of, I love mean, in the house for Dirty Dancing. All of the Lost Boys. Yes. Um, ever, anything with Winona Ryder and Christian Slater, all of it. Um, I mean, I'm trying to think. I mean, basically, I saw everything at that about that time because it was. This was still an era where it was still kind of quite affordable to go to the cinema. Now, if I take my kids, I'm like, what? <laughs> I just feel like we just bought three tickets in the stores at Les Mis or something. <laughs> It's really expensive. No, it's very expensive. And if you go and see it in any of the sort of 4DX variants, it's second, yeah. second mortgage territory. Yeah. You know, it's but it's worth it. Um, so uh, just on, just on, just on the, the sequel still, um, we moved from the kind of first... The first film was very much about, you know, being Top Gun, um, the kind of homoeroticism of the locker room, American firepower. This was much more about... There is a little bit of, you know... I mean, I hope this doesn't spoil too much to say that Iceman returns, um, and he's an he's the Admiral Kazansky now, um, and he 
it has become a sort of mentor and protector for uh, for for the Tom Cruise character, and there is there is quite a moving scene, isn't there? Oh, it's and hugely moving. Oh, it was that I was I was. Were you bits? Yeah, cried in that bit, definitely. Yeah. But you know, you're crying for your '80s self to a huge extent as it well. Is a, it so is. It's a real. It's like all these memento it's mori. For our youth, it's isn't a it? memento. Yeah, it's a memento mori, and obviously yeah. he's so ill now. But here's the was... thing, though: is that okay? So I, I, when I went to see it, and I, I was in bits, pretty much from, from the minute Top Gun Anthem yeah. began, you can imagine, just ugly tears, yeah. you know. Um, but when I, I then took my children, who are um, 19 and 21, to see it, and they loved it too. And I thought, this is really interesting, because it's very rare that you get a film that passes the cross-generational test like that. That's, uh, that's fantastic. They did it so... I mean, they really... It, it, it wasn't done by a committee, but the amount of people it, and the way it, things it tried to kind of appeal to via, as I was saying, all that video game stuff or whatever it is. But it's good. It is very exciting, you know. It's very... It's exciting, and you... They did that particularly well. I do think it is a lot about getting old, though. I loved yes. uh, all the teaching and stuff. I, it's I like time knowing to let that because at the end of Top Gun, you're like, "What? Well, he's going to be a teacher?" And then that was the only was, bit of Top Gun that, that, that yeah, rang. Yeah, they don't deal with it. With he said, "I lost the two months," two so months. they deal with that I'm very quickly. But then he yeah. does have to go back and be a teacher. And he's not a teacher again. No, yeah, um, <laughs> he's not a teacher again. <laughs> Can only, yeah, he's he's just not a natural teacher, perhaps. No, but, that's not his strength. Yeah. It's not his skill set, Tom. And yes. But as I say, it did have that thing of... It reminded me a lot of Skyfall, that sort of thing about these yes. characters are getting old. I wonder if we could make these movies about characters from the past sort of getting old, but we struggle a bit with kind of heroes that aren't in tights. I don't know, maybe... Well, Harrison Ford is, of course, returning... I know. ..the fifth Indiana Jones, and he's, <laughs> he's now, I think, 80 or 79. Yeah. So there's literally, I mean, cryogenically speaking, there's literally no limit to <laughs> where, we, where we can go with this. Well, now we see ABBA, they can, it's... it's exactly, cool yeah, the hol off. holographic Hindi. Yeah. Um, Marina, we shall come back to you with many, many questions. Mark, uh, are you there? And um, welcome. Hey, how are you? Oh, we can't hear you, Mark. Can you take yourself off mute? OK, there we are. Oh, I'm there Thanks, thanks so much for joining us. Um, and um, look, let's 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 dive into the you know the, the, let's let's get the elephant in the room out of the way. Um, tell us how you fell out of love with with Tom Cruise and Maverick because I think we need to know. <laughs> well, um, I think it's just the passage of time, but in a weird sort of way because Tom Cruise has stayed forever Maverick. Um, it's forever the uh, fighter jocks that we all fell in love with in 1986. Well, quite a few of us did anyway. Um, but the new film, um, it's incredible that he, he, basically the film seems to be about his mastery of time. He hasn't aged. He has stayed almost undead. <laughs> in a kind of immortal sort of way. It's kind of interview with a vampire almost, um, but with aerial sequences. And and that's incredible. You know, we do, we scan his face on the huge screen, looking for evidence of any kind of work, any sort of weaves. Um, well, maybe that's just me, out of bitter jealousy. But um, despite the fact that he has remained, or perhaps because he has remained forever maverick, the film has a kind of coldness to it. It's a very well-made film. It's, um, it's very watchable, and obviously it's a huge success. And my opinion doesn't matter at all. Um, but uh, it's, it has none of the emotion. It has nostalgia, about a kind of inevitable nostalgia, but it doesn't have the the emotion of the original film, which is not really so surprising. Um, it's amazing that any of us are still alive, really, after, what, 36 years. But um, the, the first film was really corny. A lot of people have said that the first film uh, was, is a worse film than the, this, this sequel, which, of course, is sacrilege. Um, but it's true that it's that this film is the, the Top Gun Maverick is better made. But um, I don't care <laughs> that it's better made. The first film was corny. 
it was like a giant pop promo for the 1980s. It was full of karaoke kind of classics and emotion. And um, that, oh, and of course, the emotion that most particularly reeled me in, apart from the fact that obviously I fancied Tom Cruise, was uh, that the film was, was very, very gay. Um, but on the, uh, in a kind of innocent and very knowing way at the same time. And of course, this is, uh, you, this is something that is accepted now or celebrated now by almost everybody thanks to YouTube clips and all the rest of it. But, and it's, not, it's, it's kind of a, a cliche, the, the homoerotism, the over-the-top homoerotism of Top Gun. But at the time, almost nobody saw it that way. Um, yes, uh, gay people will have spotted it, but a lot of other, most other people going to see it would have dropped their popcorn if you had <laughs> said any of that to them. You know, what, what, if you'd pointed out these locker room scenes looked like, you know, um, the beginning of a gay porn flick. Uh, and let's not even talk about the volleyball <laughs> sequence, um, which, funnily enough, the director, Tony Scott, admitted years later, he shot as pure gay soft porn using uh, Bruce Weber's uh, uh, photographs of military guys very, very homoerotic photographs, basically softcore gay porn, as the basis for that scene, which was completely superfluous in terms of the, pro the plot of the, uh, the rest of the movie. And that's why it's so wonderful. And you've got playing with the boys, playing as a soundtrack. It's a, it's a pop promo kind of scene, but it's, and it's very, very gay. Um, after, the, after, after the scene, if I recall, Mark, he goes off, to one of the most chaste dates in the history of cinema, <laughs> Gillis, who won't even let him have a shower, which is yes, rough. Yeah, uh, you know, well, it seems rather you know aggressive, and then um, and then she sort of slumps as he heads off on his bike at the end. It's not a successful evening. No, um, just and it's been pointed out many times as well, of course, that that her call sign. You know, her name, Charlie, is ambiguous. Um, and that she dresses as a man at one... I mean, it was, uh, it was actually um, uh, the uh, American director who made the cameo in Sleep With Me. Uh, in Tarantino. Tarantino. That's it. Yes, that's the one. Um, who, who advocate... This was the same year that my book was published in which I had a chapter about Top Gun, which was really... Uh, a chapter about Tom Cruise and Top Gun was included. And it was really about the fact that I fancied to Tom Cruise, but I did talk a lot about this, this the homoeroticism of Top Gun. And it was, it was still controversial in 1994 to point this out. And that's why Tarantino did that in that movie, Sleep With Me, because he knew that cameo explaining or arguing that Top Gun was a film about Tom Cruise, uh, uh, at war with his, uh, or conflicted about his his homosexuality, and um, uh, and that that you know he basically chooses Iceman, who represents the gay way, um, over uh, Kelly McGillis, Charlie. But um, and this was all very this was still controversial in '94. But um, you know now we we uh, we all we all kind of enjoy that aspect of it but the new film and it has new film has a, 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 a i mean it, it's, it's just as well it didn't really try to to do the homoeroticism of the first film it does have a kind of nod to it which we have in uh, uh the volleyball well it's, it's a it's a, a beach football scene um which is a, a nod to the uh, a homage to the volleyball scene, but it's so tastefully shot, <laughs> and and apparently the director um, uh, Kaczynski was uh, originally going to do it as a skins v shirts match, but the male actors mutinied because they'd spent months preparing for this topless scene <laughs> on the beach. And um, 
and they all wanted to be in the skins team. So it was, <laughs> everybody was shirtless in that scene. But of course, you were never going to have the same charge as that original scene anyway, because the world that we now inhabit was changed by that film in many ways, because that film was the, the first major, major mainstream uh, 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 kind of intrusion of not just sort of homoeroticism, but uh, it, was, it was this kind of uh, male vanity um, that had a kind, of, a kind of homoerotic or gay aspect to it because that's what male beauty and male eroticism and porn had been, had been for gay men. Um, and in the 80s, this was going mainstream uh, and it was being marketed at everybody. Um, and, and so we're living in a world where the volleyball scene has basically conquered <laughs> everything. And so it's kind of superfluous in, 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 in the new film. Um, and I'll just say one other thing about there is there is also this strange... There is a kind of acknowledgement in the plot of the homoeroticism of the first film, but it's it's very kind of subtle. So, well, subtle isn't quite the right word, but um, uh, you have you have Tom gazing longingly at stills from the original movie, which <clears throat> you know conveniently are, are are still up on the wall at um, Fighter, Fighter Weapons School, Top Gun Academy, and um, of him with Iceman uh, and also him with Bruce. And um, of course, Tom Cruise starts the movie single, childless. Um, he is still a captain. Iceman is now an admiral. And so Tom hasn't really moved on. It's, it's almost as if an, an Iceman is kind of his daddy figure in the film. I don't want to give too much away about the development in the film. Um, and then we also have a harking back to the romance with uh, uh, Goose because his son is, is identical to him, <laughs> a kind of reanimation of him, um, down to the uh, uh, sunglasses, the Hawaiian shirt, and the uh, uh, Bill Haley's, not Bill Haley, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, Great Balls of Fire at the piano. Um, so it's really a chance for, for Tom to uh, make up for the loss of Goose in, in the first film. Um, so, yes. Uh, oh, I'll just quickly mention that as far as the locker room scenes go in the first film, uh, the reason that they were there was because uh, they were Tom's idea. They were Mr. Cruz's idea because he wanted the film to be about sporting excellence rather than killing people. Um, that's why they had these locker scenes, which apparently the Navy uh, uh, liaison officer for the movie objected to for all sorts of reasons. And, um, but but uh, uh, Don Simpson was very keen to have these locker room scenes because um, he paid a lot of money for Tom Cruise, and in his own words, uh, we need to see some flesh. Um, and uh, and we certainly did. But uh, the the oh the other thing that I've mentioned in terms in that regard is that um, there is no Top Gun trophy. This will come as a terrible blow to uh, millions, but. Uh, Competition is discouraged at Fighter Weapons School. <laughs> so this whole narrative of be the best and winning the trophy was entirely manufactured for the film, the original film. Okay. Um, thank you, Mark. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to you soon. Um, Josh, can we come to you, please? Um, and your Hello. Hi, how are you? Good. Can you hear me? Very much so. Great to have you. Um, Josh, what do you, what do you, you cover the world of entertainment, Hollywood. What does the new film tell you about the state of Hollywood? Because there was a time when, during the pandemic, when people were very 
very pessimistic about this film was basically made and ready to roll and its uh, release date was postponed many times and there was a great deal of pessimism around <clears> it, but <throat> it's come out, it's made a bunch of money. W what does it tell us about the, the state of Hollywood and the industry? Well, I think um, just on a kind of fun point, I, uh, in terms of when the trailer was released, I know, funny enough, the original teaser trailer uh, for Top Gun Maverick was actually released on the same day as Cats the movie. So I think there was quite a few bits of superstition there um, from various reporters. But actually, the results from Top Gun Maverick have been nothing but encouraging when it comes to cinema and the state of the cinema industry. I mean, Going back to the pandemic, when there were films, yes, that were first being released, yes, Tenet did by kind of various metrics underperform. But as other films like Fast and Furious 7 have shown, Jungle Cruise has shown, is that actually people want to go back to the cinema to see these big budget action franchises. And Top Gun Maverick is appearing to be quite the... Uh, box office success it seems to be almost a good luck charm for tom cruise um i mean back in uh 1986 the film overall by when it in, in accounting for all the re-releases and the dvd sales it's grossed probably nearly uh, 358 million dollars by comparison top gun maverick and bearing in mind it's still in cinema so there is still money to gain from the box office it's gained over $548 million. And bearing in mind, this film also gave Tom Cruise his first $100 million opening weekend as well. And in terms of box office drop, you know, we, we, we look at um, films always having an, an amazing opening weekend. And then there's always the drop in the second week afterwards when loads of people have seen the film and then people don't see it again. We see this box office drop. Net, uh, we look at Avengers Endgame that had, I, I think it was a 40 to 50% drop in ticket sales. By comparison, Top Gun Maverick has had an unprecedented uh, drop. And when I say unprecedented, I mean the, the lack of drop. Avengers, one of the most commercially, uh, Avengers Endgame, one of the most commercially successful films of all time, um, had a 40 to 50% drop. Top Gun Maverick, by comparison, a 29% drop. This shows that people are wanting to go out and see these films. And I, I gotta tell you, we, we look, Look at Tom Cruise as, as an actor as well. We know what we're getting from a Tom Cruise movie. We know we're getting all action. It's going to be, the, you know, we're going to have some of the cheesy scenes as well, some quotable lines, some, some, some of that infamous uh, smile that Tom Cruise flashes on the red carpets. We're going to see that on the camera as well. But we know that Tom Cruise is actually, when it comes to box office, he is a draw and he's quite a reliable draw. Top Gun Maverick, um, the Top Gun franchise launched his career so it's this film represented Tom Cruise coming full circle, which I think helped with the anticipation, which is why people want to go and see it. And this is also the, the thing about this film as well. This appeal, this appeals to all ages. This isn't just an Avengers Endgame where it's um, wanting to be seen mostly by teenagers going up to come kind of mid thirties, you know, people in the eighties who are a age fit, who are, who grew up in the eighties, who were teenagers in the eighties. Some people who are middle-aged love this sort of film as well, love Top Gun Maverick, as well as the big budget action franchise to appeal to the younger generation. So that's why I think Top Gun Maverick has done so well at the box office. It's got one, a reliable box office draw, uh, an amazing cast in Tom Cruise, the prospect of him reuniting with Van Kilmer, uh, with Val Kilmer on screen, but then you've also got the, the, this kind of wide-ranging demographic to help boost sales as well. And, uh, I want to ask one more question just before we, we take some uh, points from, from, from the room. Um, it, it's very interesting because, of course, it's a film that's absolutely in love and wetting itself over technology. Um, mm. but, but, in, but in principle, it's about... There's no, there's very little CGI and green screen in it. No. And, you know, they've had the 16 IMAX cameras put into the 
the F-18s, I think, they used to film it. And one of the refrains in, in the film is, it's the pilot, not the plane, which I suspect mm. is not entirely true, but never mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so fine. so uh, locate that within where Hollywood is going. Because, I mean, you know, this week, uh, Jurassic Park 19 comes out and we'll get the chance to see, you know, even bigger pretend dinosaurs and Jeff Goldblum looking at them with surprise and going, oh, my God, um, <laughs> in a strange rhythm. Um, and, um, and really, uh, it, one of the things I enjoyed about Top Gun Maverick, it didn't have any of that. Well, I, I, yes, and I think what I would say is, it's almost like an anomaly. Tom Cruise is an anomaly in Hollywood. He is known for pushing the boundaries and doing all the stunts himself as well. And, and I think that almost adds to the authenticity of his projects as well in terms of just how action packed they are, because you know full well that actually this isn't just a stunt double doing the action. Uh, this is Tom Cruise himself. And we know as well, he's been injured in partaking in doing some of those stunts. We, he broke his ankle uh, when filming Mission Impossible Fallout, but we also know that um, he actually went to great lengths to complete Mission Impossible during the pandemic. I think we all know about uh, uh, the infamous uh, voice message that of Tom Cruise shouting at crew members that weren't wearing masks at one stage. Um, and he, he's right in what he was saying. He says the film industry is looking to us. We are setting the example. We are doing this in such an early stage of the pandemic. We are effectively the pilot run. And that's also because Tom Cruise likes to do things himself. So whilst, you know, you mentioned Jurassic Park, we're going to obviously see a lot of CGI. We know a lot of CGI is used a lot in Hollywood. We're not going to get a, a much realism um, in a Marvel movie when it comes to Doctor Strange and uh, Wanda um, in a big battle. That's going to be huge CGI effects when Spider-Man uh, flies across the city. You know, DC, where the DC world, we're not going to get realism there. But something like this, shooting in planes, this is the exact sort of project that Tom Cruise loves. He loves pushing the boundaries. Um, he loves real life action shooting. And that authenticity translate on the Top Gun screen. So whilst I think, uh, you know, we could look at Top Gun and say Hollywood's going a certain way, I actually would disagree. I think actually Tom Top Gun is very much an anomaly. Yes, we hope that um, Hollywood would use Top Gun and the likes of Mission Impossible films as examples. But, you know, there are precedents in Hollywood that Tom Cruise actually likes to break and likes to push. So uh, what we do know from this film in terms of where Hollywood's going, I, th I feel sad for period dramas and uh, Oh, and films that uh, appeal to older demographics because I don't think they're going to make the sort of money post-pandemic that they used to pre-pandemic. Some of the audience isn't yet comfortable with seeing, uh, with going to the cinema yet. We do know that certain films aren't, um, when they're released and they've been lauded by the critics, they still haven't attracted the same sorts of audiences that have been attracted pre-pandemic. But something like Top Gun Maverick, it's a friend, as I was going, it's back to my point, it's a, it's a massive franchise. It's a big box office draw coming in full circle and it's a big budget action film that attracts a wide demographic, also a younger demographic because the younger demographic are more than likely to actually go to the cinema and yes we do have the streaming services but you know the streaming service model there's all these conversations around Netflix how sustainable is it what films like Top Gun prove what films like hopefully me I, I, I think Jurassic uh, World Dom Dominion will, will uh, prove films like Fast and Furious films like James Bond these big action franchises will attract audiences more than the niche period dramas. So shame about the historical drama, no middle March maverick for now, but uh, <laughs> it's early yet. I'd love to take some um, contributions from the floor. Um, yes, my, my colleague Phoebe Davis there. Hi, Phoebe. Hi. That was like nicely led into you because my point was on Renaud Ryder because obviously Stranger Things, right? Like when's the 80s bubble going to put? burst because that's obviously come out last week it's still top of the charts there she made the joke about the fact that she was never attractive in the 80s and everyone kind of looked at her with shock and said did you see yourself mm. um and you know she's kind of stayed in that 
80s world, kind of bizarrely, which feels kind of, always feels a bit surreal. Um, but is the bubble gonna, gonna kind of burst at some point? Are we gonna get to the end of the 80s nostalgia? Are we getting a little bit sick of it? It's kind so, of yes, we know. I think her call sign was Valium, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what do you oh, reckon? I what do you reckon? I, I do, yeah, it, it's, it's odd because Stranger Things is made by people who sort of weren't alive or, yeah. or were not, you know, it, it's, they're these kind of slightly fetishised um, representation of a representation. It's great. I, I mean, I th think there's a sort of limit to it, but I have to say that the, the thing of going back into a period and kind of just even a little bit further back in time, I mean, even things that we see on TV, like um, the thing about the millionaire, you know, quiz, um, which was hugely popular. There's, there's a real thing for going back sort of, I don't know, between 15 and 40 years and covering a story or you could, real life things are becoming more and more. I, I don't know. I think there's a really big appetite for doing that still and for going back into the not very, not very distant past and revisiting true life stories particularly. And I think that's a, becoming more and more of a, particularly in television. Um, I don't, I must say, I. I, you know, it's quite a sort of nostalgic culture at, at present in lots of different ways, and I think yeah. that... They have lots of scenes that seem quite, like, picked from 80s films that the people watching it have no idea about, and yeah. obviously in, you're not going to you're not gonna pick up those references unless you're a big fan of certain kind of weird niche 80s films, but they like, are still there, which felt kind of weird yeah. to me. I mean, it's sort of a loving homage to something for which they weren't... Present, which yeah, so my, 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 my colleague Luke Bademo, who I don't know if he's here, but he says um, that, that Stranger Things is absolutely studded with references to Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, so, you know, so I, I have no idea, yeah. but, but you know, yeah. that proves Phoebe's point. Um, I think, um, I just want to I, uh, call sign Viper there, is, yeah. uh, <laughs> just, just he's head of Top Gun. From, from a, like, from, as an older demographic, I just wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we, I think there's a really interesting business story in. Like, what's the margin on a beer to buy a vintage Porsche if you run a bar? Yeah. And that's something we're definitely going to look <laughs> yeah. at as a she's new... An ad she's an admiral's daughter, James, you forget that. She oh, was an admiral's daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So she's, this is part of the corruption of the it's, Navy It's story. a side hustle. I, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. the bar's well, a side I, hustle. I guess, I actually, what was really... For me, Marie, I wanted to get some advice, really, because, obviously, it's very... <laughs> It's very exciting. One of the things that feels very true about the movie is the way that older men are much better than younger people at everything. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and, so, and I look to Tom in so much of what I do, and I've been really... It shows. It shows. But the one thing I've been And really to Tom Skerritt, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I've been really trying to show that when I'm feeling something... I, I just do this. You just see? quilt the jaw muscle. Yeah. It's very, and I can't yeah. get the, the ripple. I can't, I can't get it to ripple. <laughs> and I just wonder whether you have any advice from me as how you... How, how do you do that? As that he, is definitely a question in two as parts. As he says in Jerry Maguire, it is an up-at-dawn, pride-swallowing siege which he will never fully tell you about. Oh. He's never, never not working, ever. <laughs> He's working all, every hour God sends. And he described his agent described it in a court case over sort of access to his child as like go, doing a tour of Afghanistan or like being in the Olympics, but instead of being in the hundred meters final once in the day, you had to do it like fifteen times. Yeah. So I want you to understand that he works like no one works harder. No, no, hold, hold on, hold on. Are you serious? He do, he like he does draw. Yeah, he will he do. Works he works that thing out. Did you see my, to look like that at that age? He will obviously have to use some steroids as well because it's actually physically impossible. Hey, otherwise. hey, take it easy. Okay. Take it easy. It's, it's all use. natural. Okay, <laughs> but you know, if you saw like Mark Wahlberg's schedule recently, yes, when it came two o'clock in the morning. He gets up at two thirty in the morning and does like the first of four workouts and does all of this stuff. And it's like just so he can be in movies like Daddy's Home too. I mean, it's really. <laughs> It's just incredible, you know. Oh, it's, it's a living, it's, Marina. It's yeah, a living. Yeah, I know, but yeah. it's a huge thing, and for it's all that, the mark. Marvel actors, they're not even allowed to talk about what they have to do no, anymore. That's true, yeah. They're not allowed to talk. Even this young guy, this guy Will Poulter, he was saying, um, "I'm not really allowed to talk about what I have to do to keep in touch, to get in shape for my part, because Marvel says that some people might not have." you know, the same amount of access to money and healthcare as me. And I was like, it's so... Like, they are completely infantilised and completely <laughs> not allowed to talk about what they have to do. It is, uh, it's unbelievable. The bodies are just completely different. So everybody, you know, in order for him to play 
um, whatever, beach football and do everything. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. The amount of time you have to spend working out to be like that is just extreme. It's extreme if you're in your late 20s. At that age, it's like I can't even imagine, but, you know. So to James's point, he probably has a facial, full-time facial yoga instructor. Oh, there'll be a facial guy, yeah. A facial, yeah, right, right, be a right. Facial He'll just guy. be there yeah. on... He's set, no, you know, just jaw. Between... <laughs> just jaw, jaw yeah. right, OK, yeah, between jaw. the hours of yeah. five and yeah. six. Yeah. They have to clear the set. Well, the jaw is done. Yeah, and the yeah. jaw gets and then, done. And then, you know, so abs difficult. comes in later. It's, it's very like, difficult. Every, every, yeah. It's very difficult to fit into a, a busy day. Yes. As someone who's probably slightly more into 80s music than I am 80s film, I think I situate Top Gun within that era of films that also had a single that was released at the same time. So I, don't, I still don't think I've ever been quite as drunk as one time at uni where we played the Dage and Zone drinking game. Oh. Um, it's a drinking game, I didn't... Yeah, you, you drink every time a plane takes off. Whilst you watch Top Gun. That's quite a lot of drinking, isn't that. it? Let's be honest. It wasn't a pretty evening. But yeah. I situate Top Gun within that same era of sort of uh, Simple Minds with The Breakfast Club and Pretty Woman on TV the other day, obviously. Um, so I kind of wonder what this era of film says about this era of music as well, and whether that was a time where pop culture was so intertwined when it came to music and film, and now it seems like those are two elements that are quite separate. It's a very That's interesting really point. Interesting. Yeah, they really, they really wanted to stick a, a massive single on all these yeah. films, and sometimes they thought, "Oh, this is a rubbish song; it won't do anything." That's why they put everything I do, I do it for you on the end of, on the end mm -hmm. of that Robin Hood movie because they thought it was crap, mm -hmm. and then it was like number one for thirteen weeks, and it yeah. was just this huge <laughs> thing. But yeah, I mean, yeah, well, they didn't really have a power ballad in the middle, did they? That no. was missing. Given he did it, tried to do it so shot by shot, they should have had a power ballad. But actually, we were saying earlier. Um, he, he wasn't really allowed to have sex with Jennifer Connolly because Certainly not. she had to keep her nightie on. She kept and her he nightie had his top on visibly. Off because obviously, he, that's the, Tom. The top guy is saying he's yeah. having his top off in this she scene. She had a nice night, the, night coat yeah. on, you know. And they were sort of laughing rather sweetly on yeah, the bed. Like they, but, got, they just got back from the PTA discussing. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> just and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was, yeah. but it wasn't. It didn't sort of exude ero eroticism, did it? Let's be honest. No, the, the other one went on for it quite a long time. There was the a lot of silhouetted movie. to Berlin, yeah. take my breath away, and um, the now forgotten yeah. Kelly McGillis was, or, or, or body double was, yeah. you know, yes. in that very 80s way, moving up and down yes. a lot. In a sort of blue light in <laughs> well, the beach. Well, you know, house, he but... moved slightly forward and back and anyway. It's all, <laughs> it's all good work. Um, <laughs> other points, Tess. <laughs> Oh, sorry, I was joking on my popcorn, that's very funny. Um, I was just thinking about, um, mainly because the last, the, the only way I cope with the confidence vote last night was watching reruns of West Wing over and over and over again. Um, and I was thinking about the don't ask, don't tell policy. Which, and I'm trying to remember when that ended. Someone older than me, James, when did that end? So, Clinton. Yeah, Clinton. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but you feel like there was a whole sleeper army of this subliminal messaging, and it was the same time we were getting the Athena posters and the beginning of wax chess and muscles and, you know, sort of the homoerotic art was becoming mainstream on everyone's walls. Was there a sort of sleeper army of people who were subliminally warmed up to what was coming in terms of acceptance? And the other thing is, with Tom Cruise, who has sort of been weirdly dogged by rumours of homosexuality, as if that should be a problem, which it shouldn't be, you know, to go so full frontal... Mm, no. Um, to go so... <laughs> full on with, with a film like the original Top Gun. You think, is that just like a sort of danger thing? Is it literally like he I'm likes flying close to the edge? I'm not how much he realised quite what was happening. Because mm. he was, there's a lot of stories, a lot of interviews of actors who worked with him saying that he was just a huge homophobe and it was really, he said some, you know, some sort of terrible things and sort of obsessed. And maybe, you know, I don't know, maybe whatever he had his conflicted feelings with her, who knows? I always wonder how much he actually realised what was happening to him. Yeah. <laughs> because I do think, I'm not quite sure he would have agreed if he had understood quite the extent, to, which Mark spoke much better than I would about it, but I'm not quite sure he would have agreed no, it's, quite as... And I don't know if his it's not really coded, realized is it? either what was quite happening. Yeah, it's, it's funny, although I remember at the time people saying, is it gay? I mean, is it gay? how gay is it? I wonder if it is it meant to be gay. And, did they? Know, yes. I, didn't, and, and, I wasn't and aware of that. I, when I showed my kids the first film and told them that 
there'd been this sort of debate over yeah. the way they thought it was the funniest thing ever, much as, you know, they, when I tell them that we didn't all know that George Michael was gay, they just, yeah. <laughs> they fall off the yeah. chair laughing, you know, I mean, it, we yeah. were very naive, I think, in those days, in some respects, it was a much more... Much more and I always wonder what like, people like Michael Ovitz and everyone at his agency Yes, exactly. Felt, what did like, they really think? Because they were so careful on how they were going to launch him at the time and Paula Wagner and his, his agent, who like, obviously stewarded the, like, an unbelievable career for him, but they were so careful how they were going to launch him into the world and make him the biggest star in the world that I wonder whether they... I don't know whether they fully picked up on it either. It's a very odd quote. Clearly, it's there, and it's 100% there, and I'm, you know, but I anyway. I can see top critic Dr Kate Maltby there. Uh, well, first off, I actually owe everyone in this room an apology. I was mortified when sounds started coming from my phone earlier. But some of you will have recognised, I'm quite interested as to how many, that the sounds that were actually coming from my phone were the volleyball scene, which I was <laughs> digging up. Very good. Which work. I was trying surreptitiously to dig up, to show to Hannah over here. Um, but my question is actually about... Um, it, well, it's a technical question, but it's intellectual. It's about authenticity. So I've always read about this film as the film where they film things in the planes. And Maverick was then billed as they're going to film in the planes again. It's all going to be terribly authentic. And then um, you realize that watching it, well, they can't possibly be filming it at however many feet in the air in sort of fighter simulation. So the, the rookie, ignorant technical question is how, where, how authentic is that filming in, in the planes to those who, of you who know? But then the broader question is I'm really interested in it as a moment in Hollywood culture where we started talking about that kind of authenticity and you talked a bit about that before, like the thrill of seeing Cruz do his own stunts. But where does it fit into a kind of map of billing, billing, creating authenticity that might actually it's it's simulation of authenticity. Do we have it? any uh, aeronautical engineers in the room? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, hang on. Ah, here we go. Yeah, this, is, this, is, this is what I wanted yeah, to hear. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm very yeah. over explained because we've all got these credentials. Call sign danger. So, uh, <laughs> call sign was flopsy, actually, when I was. <laughs> I, won't, I, won't, I won't elaborate on that anymore at the moment. Um, so, I mean, I've only read some of this, but my understanding is they did film a lot of it in the planes. What they did, they filmed it in an F 18 two seater. So the guys are supposed to be flying single seaters, but they're in the back of the two seater aircraft and the cameras are on them and the pilot in the front is flying. So that's why, I mean, you see a lot of the scenes, for example, where they take the big vertical yeah. up and you can actually, I mean, you can see it in the faces of the actors, them pulling the G because those guys were actually made to fly. And actually what Tom Cruise did, in, and, I, and I've read about this, is he, and, and you can see interviews with Mars Teller and stuff, is he put them on this program of training so they went and did what's called the dunker, where that's simulating a helicopter crash. So they're put into a tank, the helicopter spins over, they have to get out. He then had them do flying lessons. They started in Cessna aircraft to light aircraft, and then they built up. So he actually had the guys like Mars Teller and that who are going to be the pilots going out, and he insisted they do that. They called it the you know Tom Cruise school of like action, whatever. So they had to go and do all this pre-prep of kind of actually learning about flying. But yeah, most of, I mean, I don't know about all of it, but most of it is, Pilots, either actual, you know, naval pilots flying F-18s and they're filming, or the guys are in the back of a two-seater. So you're seeing the expression on the face because they're actually in the jets when a lot of these manoeuvres are taking place. I saw Miles Teller being interviewed, um, and he, to use your phrase, I mean, he, he claimed they'd pulled seven Gs, seven times the force of gravity, which is like, I think, about 2,000 kilograms or something like that. It hurts. He was very pleased <laughs> with himself, seven, and who can blame him? Um, I'd like to bring back Josh, if I may, who I know wants to come back in. Josh, are you there? I am here and I'm muted, yes. Um, I, I, uh, <laughs> I want to kind of go back to the point about 80s and nostalgia and when will it be over? Um, well, yeah, and that's the thing. I, I think for the time being, it's it, there's no end in sight. We are in a nostalgia boom. We, we look at kind of strategies from the studios, and especially 
Disney in Hollywood. And we look at not just all the live action remakes of some of their old classics like Beauty and the Beast, um, got The Little Mermaid coming out soon. We had Mulan um, during the pandemic, obviously The Lion King, Jungle Book, Cinderella, Maleficent, obviously um, harking back to uh, Sleeping Beauty. We've also got Snow White on its way. But across the board, we're seeing a real kind of nostalgia reboot. So there's nothing that gets people excited um, online than harking back to one's childhood. Like, and I've actually, um, before this, I actually made quite a few notes on the sort of reboots that we've had recently. And especially, especially going back to the kind of 80s and 90s generation. I know I personally got really excited when Netflix announced a reboot of the sitcom Full House. Yes, I was disappointed that the Olsen twins weren't making a return in it, in it. but that's besides the point. You know, they were rebooting this, this old sitcom that people loved back in the late night late 80s, early 90s. We've, we've also seen the return of the Sex and the City franchise. Um, <clears throat> Look at what Disney are putting on Disney Plus there. You know, we've got Hocus Pocus 2 coming out. We've got Sister Act 3 coming out. We saw a return um, of, of from others uh, of Saved by the Bell. Uh, Netflix have remade the film Rebecca. Um, we see in Hollywood, A Star is Born with Lady Gaga as well. Chain of command on you here, Josh, but I, I do think we are possibly experiencing some mission creep. <laughs> yeah, um, not entirely sure, but basically, the, can you hear me? Is there anything? Yeah, okay. So, I mean, the, the main point is, is we are living in a nostalgia boom where so much is being brought back from the 80s and the 90s that are getting people so excited. And there's no end in sight. And this is being done not just by the big movie studios, but also by the streamers as well. Thank you so much. I'd like to, if I may, very quickly bring back Mark before we, we say goodbye. Mark, you there. Just some final words of wisdom. Uh, I'm, yes, I'm still here. Uh, well, on the subject of, um, of Tom Cruise, and did he, did he know what he was <laughs> getting into? Um, <clears throat> I think that's, it's, 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 it's a conundrum because on the one hand, he's, a, he's somebody who came to uh, the business's attention really by jumping up and down on a sofa in his underwear in risky business. Um, and then in his next, you know, really big film, the one that we're, we're all talking about all these years later, is one of the, officially, one of the gayest movies ever made, apparently. Um, but, uh, and, and it was his idea, as I said, to have these locker room scenes, <laughs> which, um, which are, are still, you know, as 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 powerful as ever. But um, I think I think the point the point to, the point that I would make about Top Gun is that it was kind of like a proto metrosexual movie, but because it was it it was using all of those advertising techniques, it was commodifying the male body, it was sell, selling male vanity and this kind of softcore gay porn. But it was done in an all-American, Republican, um, God bless America, uh, military fashion. It, it, it was packaged in a way, in a nostalgic way. The, uh, Top Gun, the original film, was extremely nostalgic already. It was nostalgic for the 1940s. Um, and it used that to, to legitimize this very, very non-traditional masculinity that it was actually packaging and selling, which... Um, of course, star Tom. And its influence carries on. I'm afraid we have run out of time. Um, but I've, I've got so many people to thank, particularly um, thanks to Mark and Seven and Kat and everyone who made the room look so absolutely wonderful. Um, I mean, you know, who could ask for more? Um, huge thanks to our wonderful guests, um, Mark, uh, Josh, and of course, Maverick here. Uh, and above all, thanks to you for, for joining in this this great occasion. Um, I can only say I'm at my advanced stage. I am increasingly writing checks my body can't cash. <laughs> but uh, I still feel the need for speed, and I feel it even more after your uh, words. Thank you so much for coming tomorrow night. Don't miss tomorrow night. Uh, we'll be making sense of democracy with uh, Viper Tom Skerritt, 
James Harding, our co-founder, tomorrow. Do not miss that, 6.30 tomorrow, Wednesday. And enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>